Hey everyone, welcome to June's uh, Patreon Q&A, supported by all of my lovely patrons. Thank you so much. And so I've, uh, what happens is I get questions in from patrons and from other people, and I answer them. So this one is going to be focused on the documentary I'm starting to work on called Being Japanese. And so the first question is, why? Who is asking for this? Is it just an ego thing? No offense. Maybe some outlets only deal with you if you have long enough content, like Netflix. Um, then shouldn't they pay you up front? If you just want a longer thing to feel like you actually made a movie, it really seems like a five-part series of 15-minute videos would get more viewership total than one 75-minute piece. But then again, what do I know? Ah, huh. so I mean, I, I like this question because it's actually something I had to answer before embarking on this. Because yeah, why can't I just make like five 15-minute videos and you've seen me do this with other things like the Homeless in Japan series um, or even with all the things I make about housing. Uh, I, I definitely have done that format. So who is asking for this? I would say nobody has asked me for this. Um, but I just, when I talk about it, people really seem to connect to it. And when I say people, it, it's mostly the you know, Japanese people, whether they're considered uh, Korean Japanese, American Japanese, Brazilian Japanese, um, anybody has any type of connection to Japan, they, they kind of have this question in their heads and um, I think they think a lot about it and I think it's a question worth thinking about, worth exploring. Um, but really, no, no one's asking and that's why I don't have any uh, financing or any deals with Netflix or anything like that. And uh, could I do a deal with Netflix or some other company um, or grants from arts councils and things like that? And I think the answer would be yeah, there is a possibility, um, but something I've experienced just working with other people, other companies over my lifetime. Um, I'm not <laughs> young anymore, but I'm not also really old and that experience as well. But the thing that happens is things get changed, right? Because you're pitching it to say like NHK and well, there's the NHK style of doing things and we want to do it this way or if I worked with some arts council, maybe it has to have a certain type of you know, spin to it or, or whatnot. But I really want to tell the story of the variety of Japanese people that there are and explore the question. I don't necessarily know if the, the documentary will have any answers. It's more really exploring what it is to be Japanese from all these different perspectives. Um, so this thing will, because there are, so, there are so many perspectives, so I've talked to people, uh, Korean Japanese, American Japanese, uh, Brazilian Japanese, and I want to talk to a lot of different types of Japanese people. And every single time I talk to somebody different, I find just little, like, not even little sometimes, but big differences in their experience. And I don't think it's really out there. So the content isn't really out there in the, in video form in a more kind of, uh, I guess, movie-like documentary format. So I think it's such a deep question that you can't just, you know, fire off a few of these interviews and say, okay, job done. Um, I kind of want to take a, both a, I guess, micro and macro perspective. So I want to go micro and like see the lives of these individuals and show them to you. Um, so hopefully maybe you'll connect with some of these people and say like, oh, okay, I, I see what they're talking about or uh, I can understand their life. Um, but also on, on a macro point of view, it's like, okay, what are the government policies a around immigration? Um, what has historically been the attitude towards immigration or, you know, assimilating uh, parts of other cultures or getting people to assimilate to Japan? And um, so take things from a historical perspective. I also want to take things from an academic perspective about identity. So talk to a professors. Um, so it, it's a lot of different things. I want to blend all into one single movie that you could watch and get something from it. So I just know this type of thing takes time and um, takes money. So that's why I'm doing it kind of. So here's a question from Javier. I believe, I believe it's Javier. Hi, Greg. First of all, I really like the work you do. It's amazing and well done. My question is, how does the Japanese political system work? Um, and some more about the politics. And you said I did amazing work. Thank you very much. Um, the, because of the focus of this q and I'm not going to get into it too deeply. But yeah, the Japanese is a, it's a democratic country. 
uh, elect officials, a couple different houses. Um, but that Japanese man, Yuta, so Yuta, he has a couple good videos explaining. Uh, one is about how Japanese political system works and elections work. And second one is talking to people on the street about their political attitudes. So I'll link those in the description, check them out. They'll offer a way better answer than I can in a minute or two. Mix, you say that you mentioned that you might be going out of Japan as well for the documentary. Where do you plan to visit? Will it be to compare other countries to Japan? Thanks. Um, yeah, the hope is, is that I'll have enough of a budget to travel to a few different countries. Um, I'll just have to see how the budgeting works and I think that'll be a big portion of what I, what I use the money for is just to travel uh, around Japan but also outside of Japan. So one of the trips I already did before I officially started this documentary is go to Korea and I'm talking about uh, you know Koreans and Zainichi Koreans um, because there's a huge Korean population in Japan are when I say huge huge relative to other ethnicities in Japan. Uh, so I think that's an important story to tell. Uh, there's a big group from China, um, there's Brazil, there's the Philippines, and Vietnam, Vietnam is the, the big one right now of new people coming in. Uh, there's, there's America, of course, and Canada. So there, I guess part of traveling to a different country is kind of seeing, well, what is the life like for a Japanese Brazilian in Brazil versus what it's like in Japan? And I think comparing and contrasting those differences um, will hopefully teach me something, teach everyone something. Um, I don't know what it is I'll find because I, I haven't been. Kevin, I read not long ago that although the majority of Japanese people claim to follow no religion, over 80% of them in fact take part in New Year's Shrine visiting. While 89% visit their ancestors' grave regularly or occasionally. How important do you think the observance of traditional religious rites, even if practiced only two or three times a year, is to Japanese self-identity. So, to maybe kind of confirm some things, yes, people follow religious practices or traditions. I think those stats sound right to me in what I've observed personally. Um, but I would also say that people aren't really overly religious, as the stats say, is that, um, so they follow the traditions and practices, but it doesn't mean they're doing it for religious reasons. It's just because that's the way it's been done and that's what their family has done, and so they're going to do it themselves. I, I don't know if you're religious or not, or from, you know, like, what, what country we're thinking about, but, you know, I often compare things to Canada, because I'm Canadian, and uh, Canadian, uh, Canada, there's a lot of Christians, and Christmas is a national holiday. So I kind of think that if you see Canadians, or I, I'm, I'm assuming this probably falls true for, for Americans as well, and probably some British people, um, you celebrate Christmas as a holiday, but not necessarily as a religious holiday. So you get together because that's what your families have done. That's what everybody does. It's a national holiday. And you get together with friends and family and eat a meal and give presents. That's, that's what you do. Um, but it's not necessarily because you're following, because you're a devout Christian or something like that. So in the same way, that's what I see with a lot of uh, Japanese people. And I, I'd say in Japan, they're even, I guess, less religious are less strongly religious than uh, what I've seen from uh, some Christians and Muslims in in Canada. Uh, it's, yeah, so there you go. <laughs> Mugism TV, how long will production take? Thanks, LWIF, life where I'm from. I'm thinking the production will take uh, approximately two years. I, I always go back and forth because sometimes I'm thinking, like, you know, if I was really organized, can I just pull this off in like six months? And I'm sure I could, but I think there's the initial interview you have with people and you get, you know, a certain fact or a certain set of facts and beliefs, but then there's kind of things happen in people's lives. And maybe for, if I interview 20 or 30 people, maybe for majority of people, I never need to do a follow-up interview, that's fine. But maybe somebody's going through a process, like maybe they're actively moving from America to Japan. So kind of seeing that journey and how it happens through time just requires time because the person's initial reaction of coming to Japan in the first month is going to be different than one year later. Uh, maybe there's somebody who's naturalizing and becoming a Japanese person and they're going through that process. Well, that process could take like a year to do, so let's follow along and see how this goes. Um, so I think there are some stories that just take time to tell. And so I have to 
give those stories the time to be told. Yeah. Um, okay, so I just wanted to say that I thoroughly enjoy the content you're making, the style, the execution, and the fact that it's not over the top, hyper, super, yeah, you know. Um, I just threw this in there because, you know, I'll be talking about maybe some, uh, some people with not so nice comments or some controversial comments. So I just want to throw in some good stuff there. So that's a nice comment. Um, okay, so here's a comment. Can't you just get a job? Um, yeah, actually that, that's a, you know, I mean, I guess you can take it two ways. Uh, one, I've always thought about, can I just get a job uh, working in Japan and then do this on the side? And actually that's what I've, I did for the first, um, what was it? How many years I've been in Japan? For four years, four out of the five years, I've been working uh, in Japan or, you know, online. So I don't know if that's called in Japan or not, but I've been working, making money in other ways and um, always doing this thing on the side. And the reason that I'm not doing that right now is because, I mean, I love doing this and as long as enough people uh, get some value out of it, I'd love to be able to continue doing what I'm doing. And um, I kind of feel it has more value than the other types of work that I can do. So that's why I'm doing it. And um, why am I asking for money on Patreon or on uh, Indiegogo to fund things like this? It's, um, it, it, it's a really new type of model, I guess. To st I, and I guess it depends what age group you're from or what perspective you have. But I mean, I guess it's like if you like a musician and you, they have music out, do you buy their CD? Because buying their CD supports it. So, I mean, if no one bought the CD, then the person can't afford to make a living making music so they have to go do other things so they just can't produce as much music or maybe it's just too hard to do it and they stop doing it so i think that's the thing for the types of videos i make i could totally make videos that are um i can pull off in a say a couple days because my, my videos always take like even my simplest videos the simplest ones have always taken at least two days to make i could do that and maybe i can find some niche, niches or niches that will allow me to keep on making it but um, while I do is like some, making some two minute videos, that's not really what drives me to make the majority of my content. Like I like having the variety, whether it is the full feature length documentary or the, you know, the more simple video, like making meals with my family. Um, I kind of want to have it all, I guess. Um, so if people are willing to support me on the longer format, more in depth content, then I'll produce it for, for the people. So <laughs> that's my take of it, take on it. It's important the documentary not exist instead of the vlog videos, but rather alongside them. I, I totally agree. So my plan is to not at all stop what I'm doing, uh, publishing videos on the Life Where I'm From channel and the Life Where I'm From X channel. Um, the budget is mainly, it, it actually doesn't, I mean, the, but with the budget I have right now, it doesn't give me any money whatsoever. And, and in fact, I'll have to put out some of my own money into it. It's more to cover, cover travel expenses, um, equipment, like I'll have to buy a lot of hard drives to store all this footage. Um, I have to get some new uh, microphone gear to interview a couple people at a time and do a better job of getting quality audio because that's so important. Uh, I'll have to pay for some interpretation and some translation and there's music rights. There's a whole bunch of um, little expenses um, or maybe not so little expensive that add up uh, to make a feature length documentary expensive. Whereas if you're just, you know, doing your vlog style handheld camera, you can do that with a you know $500 camera and be completely fine. So I guess it's just the level of quality of production you wanna do and um, the scope of things. So I plan on making this in a, in a bigger scope. But anyways, I'll still be producing regular content all the way through, but I will say, once I have everything shot and I get into really into the edit, there might be a few months where I either slow things down a lot or maybe there's a month where I just have to stop everything and just really focus on finishing the documentary. So I am sure there will be a time in the future where I'll have to take a little, little bit of a break, but that's not anticipated for the next year or so. Foreigner living in Japan suffers identity crisis, decides to make YouTube video about it. Wow, how original. And that's all in capitals, so it really is, wow, how original. Um, yeah, I guess if you just watched a single video of mine, then you can come up to that conclusion. I, in some ways, this, vid, this documentary is and is not about me. 
Um, so the way it is about me is because I consider myself a Canadian and I have a mixed background, both, uh, I don't know, ethnically, culturally, blood type, however you want to define it, I definitely have a mixed background. And I think I'll make a video about that later on, talking about who I am. Um, but suffice to say is that, uh, maybe the simple version, right? I, I grew, I was born in Canada and I was born in Winnipeg, which is primarily a, a, a white place, you know, Caucasian place. And there I kind of had an, a bit of an Asian identity. Um, then I moved to Vancouver, which if any of you uh, know Vancouver, it's more of an Asian kind of place. So there I kind of, I was like more like a white person than an Asian person. So I kind of lost that Asian identity going to Vancouver. And then going to Canada, I'm just the foreigner, you know? So maybe not even, I'm definitely not Asian and I guess maybe white, but maybe just foreigner is probably the best way you can describe it. Um, but throughout all of these, you know, places and changes, I've always felt that I can call myself Canadian and have that single identity to um, hold on to and no one ever questioned it. So I think with um, some of the people that I'll be interviewing and well, I've been told by certain people is sometimes they don't feel uh, like they are any, any single identity. And there's, it's, it's hard when you don't have an identity that you can just feel that you are and that people accept. Um, so I want to tell the story of these people. So it's, it's, the idea is kind of inspired by my feelings and how my identity changes and where I go. And the same can be said for, for my kids. Uh, but really it's, I don't think it's about me. It's about the people. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if it's not original, then I don't know how many things are original nowadays, right? All right. In order to give raise, um, Oh, this person's talking financially to give money. I'll be interested in getting some data. Cost, time, spend, travel, salary. Oh, I guess I already answered all this monetary, this, this monetary question. So yeah, no pay for myself expected. Not, not at least the funding levels I'm, I'm getting right now. Um, and maybe in the end, if I can sell the documentary to say like Netflix or something like that, then sure, yeah. Or maybe if people, when I have it out, they'll, they rent it or buy it. Um, enough of them, then yeah, maybe I'll, I'll get some money out of it. But currently it's just, um, covering, hopefully covering the majority of my costs type of proposition that's being done. Um, so yeah, I don't think I have too much more to add to this question beyond what I said already. And the last thing here is, um, most Japanese think this video is for propaganda or globalizational SJW, which I, I just learned last year. It means social shows. <laughs> <laughs> Social justice warrior. Um, it's the answer. Japan is a nation of assimilation. Japan will not change like Canada or USA, but Jap Japanese never say the truth to foreigners because it may disappoint foreigners. This has not, not relationship. This has not relation with racism. For example, I live in Hokkaido prefecture. If I move to Kyoto prefecture, Kyoto person never recognized me as Kyoto person. I am only a stranger. Kyoto person often says, if you want to be a Kyoto person, you must live three generations. It's not, not joke. Only Tokyo is exception. Um, so is this stuff, am I like an SJW propaganda warrior or something? Um, I actually have to look up the terms. And so uh, social justice warrior was actually a fairly neutral term uh, before. It was kind of, I mean, you're, 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 you are for social justice, which, you know, things like equality, equality, like human rights, uh, gender equality, um, racial equality, those types of things. So, um, taking that, I don't know, neutral definition of social justice warrior. Yeah, totally. I am a social justice warrior. Um, now I guess more recently it's been used to call out people who, um, I don't know, maybe a, a good example would be like there's like incidents of cultural appropriation or there's, I don't know, instances, maybe there's people calling out people for culture, culturally appropriating things. So um, somebody wears a kimono, well, that's maybe not culturally. <laughs> you're, you're taking something from Japan for your own pleasure and gain and stuff like that. And um, so if, if that's what being a social justice warrior is, then yeah, that's not me because I kind of just look at what's respectful to people uh, of that culture. And if people from that culture like you to wear a kimono, which 
I think it's been fairly covered now that Japanese people don't really care if a foreigner wears uh, a kimono, just like, I don't know, Western people don't care if you see a Japanese person wearing a, a cowboy hat or a, a tuxedo or something like that. Um, then, yeah, I, I think, um, then, yeah, what? Now, propaganda, that's a more negative term, and uh, there's different definitions to it, but essentially it could be like false or misleading uh, information to try to persuade someone to do something or to think a certain way. So that one, I would have to say no, but of course I would say no. Um, I don't think I'm trying to be false or misleading. Uh, but another you know, part you can read into the definition of propaganda is that you have a bias. And yes, I would agree that I have a bias and I think that's important for you to recognize. My bias could be fairly obvious in that I have Japanese children. I mean, they have a Japanese citizenship and passport and I have Canadian children with a Canadian citizenship and, pa and passport. So I'd like them to be able to be both at the same time. And when they are 20 years old, they'll have two years to decide to whether to take the Japanese side of them or the Canadian side of them. And I say side because it feels like it's choosing between two sides of yourself or two parts of yourself. Or maybe you just are those two things simultaneously. Like I am a male, I am Canadian, um, right? I am a video producer. I'm all those things simultaneously. So I guess it feels tough for me to know that my kids will technically have to choose between being a Japanese citizen or a Canadian citizen. citizen. I really wish they could be both. Um, so if there's any bias that I have, I think, yeah, that's probably a pretty strong bias on my part. All right, so I've answered a lot of questions. If you have any more questions for me, please feel free to leave them in the description below or the comments below, I should say, and I'll try to answer them as best as possible. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you on the flip side. Cheers. And peace.